you're watching the free version of this tutorial. Upgrade to premium for all footage and project and exclusive content. In this first exercise, what we're going to be doing is looking at the fundamentals of planar tracking, figuring out what planar tracking actually means and how we set about doing our first track. Okay, so I'm working in Premiere at the moment, but when we're working with Mocha, the same principles apply no matter what the host is. So the first thing I'm going to do is come into my effects and apply the Mocha Pro filter to my clip. And let's launch Mocha Pro. And now once we're in the Mocha interface, this is going to be the same regardless of where you originally started from. And before we go any further, let's have a very quick look at the user interface. Now we've got a lot of buttons at the top and we're not going to go through every single one of these buttons at the start. A lot of these will start to work with as we get through our different projects. So the most important thing to know straight off is how we create our first track. And to do that, we need to create a shape. Because unlike point trackers, Mocha is a planar tracker. So we're tracking planar textures instead of just a single point or series of points. So back up to the toolbar, and we can either create an X-spline or a Bezier spline. We'll talk about these a little bit later. So I'm going to select my X-spline tool and then come down into the viewer and then create the first shape. So it's this window now that we're going to be tracking. Now, the very basics behind creating a good track in Mocha is to create our shape. Then at the bottom, we come in and tweak our parameters, track it through, and then export the data. And the default values of these parameters are often good enough that once we've got our shape in play, all we have to do is come up to the track on the viewer, hit track forward, track backwards if we want to, and that will go through, tracking everything, hopefully perfectly, and then we can either export our tracking data or we use that tracking data in another way later on. And essentially, that's the very basics of creating our first track in Mocha. We drew a shape, we hit track forward, that's it, job done. But I think we can do a little bit better than that. So I'm going to undo a little bit more. We can go through and understand a bit more about why I did what I did and about what these parameters are actually doing. So let's just undo all of that, have a look at things in a bit more detail. Now, the advantage of tracking this area instead of just a single point is it gives us a bit more information to work with so we can get a better idea of the movement, the object, or the camera. Now, the big thing to remember when we're drawing our original shape is we want to make sure that the object is coplanar. So it has a shared relationship in regards to movement in itself and towards the camera as well. Now, coplanar objects are everywhere. So if I pop back into After Effects now just to do a bit of drawing, we can see that this area here is coplanar. Most of this roof here is pretty much coplanar as well. So it means everything's sitting in the same plane. And if I want to track this wall here, I could take anything along here and all of this side of the wall is coplanar. Just do a couple more. So we have the side of this building here as well. That's pretty much coplanar there. So this yellow here would not be a good place to track if we were after something on this plane here, because what it's doing is it's taking in multiple planes. So it's taking in this plane here, it's taking in this plane down here, this one to the side of the building, and this one, and this one for the side of the other building. So we're actually intersecting a whole lot of areas here. So you're not going to get a good description of this movement if you're tracking everything around it. So let's pop back into Mocha and see how that works in practice. So I'll just undo all of that with Control or Command Z, and I'll draw my spline one more time. We have our choice of either doing an X spline. So we have one single control point and a control handle. And we're going to look more in depth at that in a later exercise. Or we can also use the Bezier splines up at the top here. Now, once we've finished drawing our shape, to close it off, all I have to do is right click and that will close my shape for me. We always need to be working with closed splines. We can't be working with open splines here. As soon as I've closed off that spline, you can see if we come over to the left in our layer controls that it's created a new layer for me. And I'm going to rename this window track. 
And as you can see, as I drag on the separators between the windows, they're going to be scaling up and down for me as well. If we want to, we can rearrange our work area as well. I'm just going to leave this as default. So we have a look at our little buttons here. We have our visibility eye here. So this just turns the visibility of the layer on and off. We have our process cog. And what this does is it tells Mocha whether we're going to be tracking this layer or not when we start to process stuff through, whether it's going to render this out or not. We have our lock and this locks our layer up so we can't make any changes to it. And it means even though we've got the process cog turned on, we're not going to be able to do any tracking on that. Though in different modules, this won't stop it from contributing to the render. And we have the ability to define shapes. Now we have the outline shape. We can make that any color that we want to, just using the standard system color picker. Thank you very much. Okay on that. And we have our fiddle shape as well. So we can find a good contrast color depending on our footage. Now we haven't got fill turned on, which is why you can't see it at the moment. And we'll work with the rest of the buttons in the layer control a little bit later on as we need to. Okay, and we're going to take a look at a bit more of the stuff in the viewer a little bit later as well. Let's come down now and have a look at our modules. Now, depending on which version of Mocha you're using, you'll have different modules available to you at the bottom of the interface. And you can find a full list of compatibility on the Imagineer Systems website. Now, the default settings we have here are going to be good enough a lot of the time, so you don't even have to touch these to get a good track. So briefly blowing through these, we have our input, where do we uh, select our input clip? If we've got it with the Mocha Pro plugin, our default will be layer below, which is using the input from the host. Or if you're using the standalone, you'll be seeing the clip that you imported in the standalone there. When it comes to the input channel, we can either choose the luminance or auto channel, which will go through and have a look at the RGB color channels and then make an informed guess about which one is your best contrast channel and then use that for the tracking. We're going to leave it with uh, luminance for now. The minimum percentage of pixels used is probably the most important control you can work with once you've decided what type of motion you're trying to track. Because this determines how many pixels Mocha is going to be looking for between one frame and the next. And the default setting here will be based on the size of your input resolution and the size of your shape. So if you have a, a high resolution image and a big shape, that's going to default to a smaller percentage of pixels used. Now you might think that cranking this all the way up to 100% is going to give you the best result. But I can tell you that probably this isn't going to be a winning strategy for you. Because one of the things about Mocha's planar tracker is how resilient it is to things like motion blur, changes in light and noisy footage. And the reason it's so effective is that we don't have to have this cranked up really high for it to get a good result and find out what's going on in the track. You'll see that counterintuitively, Sometimes when I'm not getting a good track, instead of turning this minimum percentage of pixels used up, I'm going to turn it down instead. And the smoothing level will smooth out our image before the track is put in. And that could be good for very noisy footage, but in most cases, we're going to leave that at zero. Now, the rest of the controls we're going to be looking at in another exercise. So let's just see now how we can get this tracked through. So I'm going to come up to my viewer controls here. I'm going to go to track and just hit my track forwards button. So I can either choose to track one frame forwards or just track forwards there. And if we haven't started at the start of the clip, I can always track one frame backwards or just track backwards as well. So whenever we're trying to get a good track, we always want to choose the frame where we have the most information. So probably the sharpest bit of the image or where the object is completely on screen. And that seems to attract through quite nicely. Okay, cool. So now I'm going to come in and I'm going to come to my playback controls and I'm just going to play this forwards. I'm just going to hit play and that's just going to play that backwards and forwards, ping ponging it back and forwards there. I can change my playback mode to loop or to play once. We'll keep it going with playback and forwards. So this looks to be a decent track. We see that the shape itself is moving consistently with the image which is quite nice. Let's stop that for one second. How do we actually check whether it's a good track though? So here's another really important concept for you to get your head around. And that's the separation between the shape that we've created here and the tracking data that's underneath. If I wanted to, I can now come in, once our track's done, I can come in and make this shape as weird and wonderful 
as I like. And you can see that that's kept the shape. It's added a little keyframe, but it's kept the shape and the track is still consistent with this new shape. Let's undo that. I don't want to do that at all. Let's do that a few times. Lovely. So how is it that we see the tracking data and check that tracking data when it's separate to the shape that we actually see here? Well, that is done by this button at the top here with the S. Now that is the surface button. And what this does is it shows the planar surface that we've tracked. And what I can do now is I can adjust where this surface goes. And I'll place it on the uh, points of the window frame. And let's play that back. And in the track module, the surface has no keyframes. I can come over here now. I can move my surface up so that it's taking in a bit more of the roof. For example, let's take that round about there. And, and you can see as it plays back there that the surface itself is not changing shape. So this is just showing us and defining the planar surface that it's tracked in. And if we go up to the top of the viewer again and click on the button next to the surface. This is the grid. Again, this is another way of just trying to visualize what that plane that we've tracked actually looks like. And we come up to the top again here. I can turn off our control points or our shape so we can just look at the surface and the grid here. And this grid extends out from the surface so that we get a better idea of any sort of shakes and judders that's going, that are going on uh, with any sort of small movement because those small shakes and judders will be amplified by the grid here. But actually that's looking pretty good. And the cool thing is we can track multiple shapes and multiple planes simultaneously as well. So if I turn my uh, shapes back on, turn my grid and my surface off for a second, and let's create two new shapes for two new planes. Now we don't want to add anything to the layer we've already got. So we don't want to use this shape here. We're going to create a new X spine layer. And let's just take this one here. That's fine. And let's create a new layer as well. Which is going to be the wall up there. So let's uh, in the layer controls, let's give these names. We'll call this one wall track and we will call this one flower window track. Cool. Now I've already processed out this window. Don't want to do that anymore. So let's turn off the process on this one here. And I'm at the end frame. So I can now just track backwards. But all of the things at default, you can see the minimum percentage of pixels used on my flower window is 30 rather than 90 because the, the shape itself is bigger than the uh, the previous one was. And we turn on the surface on that. I can come in and define my surface, come over to the wall, check what's going on over here as well. Bring that around about there. Cool. And instead of just using the grid that we had here to check out our shapes, what we could also do if we come to layer properties is that we can do inserts as well, just to check things out. So we've got an eight by eight grid come to my window here. I can also choose a different insert here to do 16 by 16 grid. And on my window track down here, let's do the Mocha logo. Let's turn off the shape outlines one more time and play that back. And you can see I've now defined three shapes and done planar tracks on all three of them. And they're all looking pretty good. So that's a basic idea about what the planar tracker is and a quick overview of the user interface. In the next exercise, what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the power of the planar track to track objects as they go off screen and some little techniques that we can use there. And of course, we're going to start to build up our knowledge of the interface as well as we use some new tools. So join me in exercise two.